I don't have a title for the sermon, but if I were to write one down, I think it would be, even Jesus can have a bad day at work. <laughs> because you see in the gospel today, a startling example of failure. A startling example of a lack of fruitfulness of labor. The Lord heals ten people and only one comes back to say thank you. Only one recognizes him as the Lord. Only one of them discovers faith that is truly saving. So that's a 90% attrition rate. That's a bad day at work. And as I read this gospel, I was reminded of a very sobering and startling fact that it can be more than just a bad day at work. It can be a bad year at work. It can be a bad decade at work. It can be a bad century at work. What do I mean? Well, in 2010, a very comprehensive study was made within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, which is the, by far, practically exponentially so, the largest uh, jurisdiction of Orthodox Christians in America. And it was found that 90% of Americans with Greek roots are no longer in communion with the Orthodox Church. And just looking at the last generation, it was 60%. 60% um, had fallen away. That is a terrible rate of attrition. It's not entirely so different than the general kind of falling away from church that we see happening in America. There's an increasing rise of the unchurched and the, the nuns, as they're now being called. They have no church. So um, it's not just a problem for the Orthodox, but a problem for Christianity as a whole. And while the study was, of course, done by and for and to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, there's no reason to expect that the findings would be particularly or profoundly different according and across other ethnic jurisdictions or ethnic lines. Now the reason which is often given to explain what is viewed as effectively a mass apostasy is the influence of intermarriage and a failure to reach out to the non-ethnic partner or to their mixed families. And there is a certain amount that is true with that. I mean, we have experienced uh, a lot of movement within the Orthodox in our country, even within our own parish, between churches that are more ethnic to churches that are more, let's say, diverse, or at least more American, which is another ethnicity in the end. So that's nothing new to us, but it's not necessarily the cause of this falling away. And it shouldn't be treated as a cause. Intermarriage happens. It happens. Regardless <coughs> of what we might want to do or say or think. And it is, in fact, not inherently good or bad. In fact, it is also probably the most common form of bringing people into the Orthodox Church. As somebody has said, what is a Orthodox convert? It's a guy who marries a Greek girl. Statistically speaking, it's actually more true than not. So, my apologies for those of you who came the, the old-fashioned way of repentance. <laughs> there are more people who just married into the church than who didn't. And that is fantastic. And that's a wonderful thing. So intermarriage is not a bad thing, it's not a good thing, it's a thing. And we have to deal with it. So, the church wants to do something about something it can do. If it wishes to improve these numbers, there are certainly many things that it can do better. Now the first and the most obvious thing, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, is to point out that the church needs to reject all forms of philatism. Philatism, what is that? 
Philatism means when you identify your church with a national or an ethnic or a cultural or a racial identity above all others. That it becomes subservient to the nationalist or ethnic cause. That is, that is a form of heresy and it's condemned as such. We must be orthodox for the sake of orthodoxy, for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of a real relationship with God, not because our old country or our ancestry <coughs> had that same faith. I remember once I was uh, at a little festival, um, it was a Greek, it was a different ethnicity, and somebody was talking about why their faith was important to them. And, and the only thing that they could say to explain why they liked orthodoxy was because it made them feel uh, close to their ancestors. It was ancestor worship, filial piety. Uh, it wasn't deeper than that, sadly. And unfortunately, we see the same principle is actually nothing new. We see it in the gospel. We see that it, ex it happened in the time of Jesus. Why? Ten people ask the Lord for mercy. He heals them, but only one comes back. And who is the one? The Samaritan. And Jesus says, where, where are the nine? Is this only this foreigner? This stranger? This Samaritan who comes back? That, that is there because it's an indictment of the moribund ethnic concern of the Jewish church. When we talk about the Old Testament church, it was focused in on itself about preserving and protecting the Jewish identity, but it wasn't about being transformed by God. Remember, the nine did what they were supposed to do. What did they do? They went to church as Jesus told them to do. Go show yourselves to the priest. Go do the rituals that the Torah requires of you. They did what they were supposed to. They followed the rules. They were good. They were good, faithful people. But they were not transformed inside by doing all of these customs and keeping all these commandments. They were still they were still unaware of what God was calling them to have. So simply being a warm and inviting parish to people who are not of the dominant ethnic form is not in and of itself going to change anything. It's not sufficient for the church to be able to correct its course. The church was specifically given by our Lord Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead the great commission. A great commandment to go into all the world, to teach all nations, to baptize them and make them disciples. Now in the last century, the Orthodox Church was given an unprecedented ability to explode across the entire globe through mass migration, through the improvements in travel and transportation that we saw at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Emptying many parts of the old world and filling the new. But when they came, how many did they teach? Yes, they baptized many. What did they teach them? And did they baptize more than their own? Even those who have been baptized in the church do not necessarily stay. And that's what the attrition rates we're talking about have to do with. It's about those who are baptized, but a generation later are no longer in the church. Why? Because even if they were taught, even if they were baptized, were they made into disciples? That's the key. The church's job is not to be necessarily just hospitable or to have good outreach or to have good programming and good lessons and so forth, the nice services, and to be a pleasant place to go. It must effectively make disciples out of those who come. You, me, our children, and our children's children. Sometimes the church did make disciples and those people looked around and they didn't find any other churches that had them. And so, because there was no water, they dried up and they withered away and they were lost. We've lost a lot of really good and talented people because 
churches have failed to do their jobs and to be an inviting place for discipleship. So, we are each called to become disciples. What does that mean to become a follower? A follower of Jesus Christ. And in following Jesus Christ, transmit that life to others through bearing witness to Jesus Christ through our life, through our faith, through our actions, through our love for one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples, says the Lord. If you want a very specific description of how that looks, all you need to do is look at what we read just a few minutes ago in the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians. The letter of the Ephesians is the epistle about the church. And we'll tell you just about everything you need to know in the New Testament about what it means to be part of the church. We'll look at this on Wednesday night in adult head. But in Ephesians chapter 5 we read, Find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. So to summarize, what, are the, what is the description of the disciple process? One, find out the truth. Find out what is good. Find out what is right. Find out what is expect, acceptable to God. Be a seeker, first and foremost. And never stop. Always be a seeker. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you must never stop being a seeker. You must be able to sing, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And mean it. Recognizing we're always on the journey. Two, cleanse yourself of wicked deeds. Expose the unfruitful works of darkness to the light, through confession, and walk in the light of repentance. The act of those lepers going to the priests was an act of confession, revealing their illness and being healed. Three, live in newness of life, living new life which is guided by wisdom and filled with the Spirit. And make that a priority. The maintenance of a daily spiritual condition with God. And four, <coughs> worship together. Worship God, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's the first part of the liturgy. That's why it's important to come on time to liturgy. Not after the sermon, not during the epistle of the readings, even the first parts of this, of this liturgy are part of discipleship. It's where we warm our hearts up by singing psalms and spiritual songs and hymns and get our sense of fellowship grounded so that when we sit and listen to the sermon, we're already ready. Our heart is in the right place. So the story of the Ten Lepers shows a similar process. They first come to knowledge of truth of some sort because they recognize that Jesus had power to heal them. So they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. They do the first part. Then they go to church. They go to the priests. They fulfill the required ritual. They are cleansed of their disease. But only one walks in newness of life as a result. Only one becomes a disciple. Only one comes back to give thanks to God and worship Him as is right. And so Jesus says only to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Were not the other nine made well? They were cleansed of their outer disease, but not of their inner ailment. They were not fully well. They were only half measures. So the, full, the, the last man, the Samaritan man, is the one who experiences full restoration. He has the transformed life. Now in a recent article that I know some of you uh, read and shared from Christianity Today, it was entitled, The Real Reason Young Adults Drop Out of Church. This was written uh, from the perspective of primarily evangelical Protestants. But what it has to say is fairly true across all forms of Christianity. Uh, but this is what the conclusion of the author was. 
He says, the reason that many church attending young adults stopped going to church upon graduating from high school, their faith just, uh, just wasn't personally meaningful to them. They did not have a first-hand faith. The church had not become a valued and valuable expression in their life, one that impacts how they live and how they relate and how they grow. Church was perhaps something their parents wanted them to do. They may have grown up in church, and perhaps they faced pressure from parents to be involved in church, but it wasn't a first-hand faith. Now, the conclusion can be a little misleading because the same author recognizes uh, by pointing to another study that your family is the most important determiner of whether you stay in church or not. So it is important that families uh, disciple children. In fact, it's in the family and not in the parish where the most important work is done. You can't have it without the parish, but it's the parish brings it together and extends the family. But it's the family that is the incubator for disciples. In fact, there are three main ingredients that make the biggest difference for whether a young person continues in their faith after they leave the nest, after high school. The first is, do they have a good relationship with their parents? And that means, do the parents allow them freedom to disagree? Freedom to not always want to go along with the program? Orthodoxy is rooted in freedom. You cannot make disciples of people by forcing them into it. It must be something they freely choose. That means you have to give them, like God gives us, the freedom sometimes to choose otherwise. Two, a good relationship with another adult that is not a parent, a mentor, somebody who will be influential. Sometimes it's the priest. Uh, sometimes it's a Sunday school teacher. Sometimes it's just somebody who's a friend of the family that they meet at the church. You all have the possibility of being that person for a young person. Don't be afraid to stand in the gap. Don't be afraid to step forward and serve God that way. It's very essential. And three, a relationship with God himself, which comes directly through spiritual experience. If a young person has some kind of a spiritual experience with God when they're a teen, their chances of staying in church will grow much more. If they've never experienced any sense of the holy, if they've never experienced any emotion in their heart or spirit that there is even a God. This is all wah, 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 wah. It's all the penis teacher talking. You can only get this if it's inside you. So what the authors of that uh, young adult article are getting at is that first-hand faith means that a young person must have made a personal commitment to God and made the faith their own. That is true. I can't, I can't stand at the pearly gates and say, well, my parents were Orthodox. Don't I get a family membership pass? <laughs> it has to be my own faith. It has to be real. And if my children are not in the faith, um, then I really have to make sure that I look back and say, did I have a good relationship with them? Did I make sure that they had good relationships with other influential, positive people? And three, did I care for their soul? We'll talk about this more next week. It's a necessary step in discipleship. You know, Andrew is called the first call. But Andrew went and told his brother, I think we met the Messiah, come and see. But it was Peter who had to make his own choice and stand and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had to do it for himself, too. So in conclusion, let us consider three basic truths about the Christian faith and how Christianity is, in fact, the wonderful reverse of leprosy. It's the mirror and the cure of what ails us. But it also follows the same kind of pattern. One, cannot transmit Christianity unless you have it yourself.
cannot spread it to others unless it's already inside of you. You must be a disciple first. Two, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time to mature in the faith, and sometimes it can take many years to manifest symptoms, even though the seed or the germ, if you will, is in there. Be patient. Be patient with those that you are worried about, whether they're going to stay in the faith or not. Make sure that the conditions are right for the seed or the germ to grow. Three, without proper care, nine out of ten people will wither on the vine. That's what the statistics are telling us. Lack of spiritual care can result in painful disfigurement, loss of sensitivity, and a whole host of other complications in life. Make sure that you are receiving the proper spiritual care. Make sure that you are nourishing yourself from the scriptures, from the church. Most importantly, through regular receiving of the medicine of immortality, which is the Eucharist itself, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how the church has always understood what we're doing here. We're coming here every Sunday to receive the life-giving nourishment from the Lord himself, so that we can continue the rest of our life with strength, with purpose, with clarity, with faith. So may God bless you, heal you, and help you and all of your family members through the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.